Thank you for inviting me to this workshop and welcome everyone to my virtual presentation on label efficient visual abstractions for self-driving. This is joint work with Asim, Kashyap, Aditya and Ashit. There's two dominating paradigms to self-driving. On the one hand, we have the modular pipeline where the image to action mapping problem is decomposed into a set of modules that can be independently developed by larger uh, research and development teams. And this is therefore one of the main approaches that is followed in industry. It also leads to an interpretable representation because one can expect the interfaces between the individual modules. However, the design of the pipeline and the models often requires expert decisions, which are not necessarily optimal. And these modules are often trained in a piecewise fashion, where one module is not trained for the ultimate goal, which is safe and efficient driving, but rather for some intermediate loss functions, such as an object detection loss. Another idea is to represent this complex sensor to action mapping directly through a neural network that is trained using either imitation learning or reinforcement learning. Such an approach is very simple to implement and it allows for training the parameters of the network end to end for the actual driving task. However, existing models do not generalize as well as modular pipelines as they are missing the inductive biases that are incorporated into these pipelines. They are also less interpretable and they require a lot of data for training. Let me show you a video of some of the results of a imitation learner that we have obtained on the Kala simulation environment. As you can see, even in simulation, scenarios can be quite complex with pedestrians walking on the road or traffic lights that need to be obeyed. And there's many things that can actually go wrong, such as not respecting a traffic light, stopping in front of a reflection by misdetecting it as a pedestrian, crashing into another vehicle, or driving off-road, or simply hurting our people, luckily only virtually here. Now, there is a model that lies between these two approaches and that tries to combine the benefits of both, which is called direct perception, where there's a neural network that maps the sensory input to some intermediate representation. And then there's a either hand engineered or learned vehicle controller that maps this intermediate representation to the action. Now this intermediate representation should be designed in a way such that it captures all information that's necessary for driving, but not much more. And this on its own is a difficult task, of course. Now here we are in the workshop on multimodal learning and there is some modalities to consider here. So there's on one hand, um, the modalities of the sensory input, which could be either images, LIDAR, radar or GPS. We will not consider this part in this talk here. We will simply consider an image-based input for this talk. But there's another modality I want to argue that is relevant here, which is the modality of the intermediate representation. And that's the focus of this talk. What intermediate representation should we choose? Should we choose semantic segmentation? Should we choose 2D or 3D bounding boxes? Should we choose, should we choose depth or should we choose motion or optical flow. There's a couple of related work that have looked at this problem before us, and I want to quickly walk you through. First, I want to present a imitation learning baseline that we use in our approach. This is actually one of the state of the art imitation learner on Kala that was published at ICCV last year. It's called uh, CILRS. Um, and it's a conditional imitation learner that maps observations to actions 
but also conditions on an additional command, a high level command that's provided by the route planner that tells the system to go either left or straight or right at the next intersection. For imitation, training data is obtained almost fully automatically by simply recording data with a web camera and uh, at the same time also recording the signals of the pedals and the st uh, steering wheel. So that's relatively cheap. However, standard imitation learning algorithms typically suffer from the problem of causal confusion, such as the inertia problem, where the model observes the vehicle speed being zero, leading to, in most cases, an acceleration of zero. This is undesirable because in these cases, the vehicle after stopping will never start again. In order to combat this problem in this CLRS approach, the authors um, presented a two-stage model where an image is input into this backbone here that predicts now both a, the current speed as well as a feature representation, which is concatenated with the measured speed and fed into a second conditional module. The advantage of this setup is that now this backbone, this perception module is encouraged to produce feature representations that are actually causally relevant for driving by also trying to predict the speed. And the paper shows that this actually helps in solving this problem. Still, this conditional imitation learning approach does not generalize very well to new environments. And the reason is simply that it overfits to the training environment. At the same time, it has very large training variance, which means if you change the seed that is used for training the model, which changes the initialization of the random weights in the network or the order with the data with which the data is sampled, then the variance on the test set of the actual driving metric will be very large. This of course is undesirable because it makes models very difficult to compare. Another approach is an approach that we've presented at CORAL 2018, which is called conditional affordance learning. This is closer to this direct perception approach that I've presented before, where observations are mapped to some low dimensional intermediate representations we call affordances. And then there's another um, controller that maps these affordances to actions. These affordances in this case are very low dimensional. We just have six dimensions in this case. For instance, the angle with respect to the road, the distance to the lane, the boundaries, or to other cars, etc. So we, we just include the affordances which we think are relevant for driving. Here you can see an example. We see the distance to the next car. We have this red box, which is the hazard flag. If there's a pedestrian appearing in the red box, then there's a hazard affordance to be detected. Here we detect speed signs in this green box. So it's all quite hand engineered. These affordances are then automatically extracted from the simulator at training time to train a perception module that predicts these affordances. And at test time, then a controller can take in the predicted affordances for the actual control problem. The advantage of such an intermediate representation is that it decouples perception and action and therefore has been shown to generalize better. However, in this original paper here, we considered a rule-based controller, so it wasn't differentiable and trainable. And one important problem of this approach is misspecification of affordances, which happens quite easily, which means um, that if the set of affordances is not specified such that it fits all scenarios, like for instance, this areas are not determined in a way that they, for instance, also hold for intersection scenarios, then the model, of course, will not work in these scenarios. Now, a number of papers have considered more general more classic computer vision representations as intermediate representations for the self-driving task. Here's one example. 
In the paper, Does Computer Vision Matter for Action? They analyzed various intermediate representations, including semantic segmentation, depth, normals, optical flow, and albedo for the ability to help in this uh, generalization problem. And they found that intermediate representation improved results and they got consistent gains across different simulations and tasks. They also found that depth and semantic provide the largest gains where semantics helps most in the urban setup, which we are considering here in this talk, and depth helps most in the off-road traversal setup. And they also found better generalization performance using these intermediate representations. They also produced a nice little video um, that shows the uh, key idea quite nicely, which I'd like to show you now. Our planet is teeming with intelligent life. Biological creatures sense the world and move through it to survive and reproduce. And soon they may be joined by artificial creatures, robots designed to see, move and act. How should such robots be constructed? Researchers have explored two approaches. One uses structured intermediate representations to link perception and action. These intermediate representations are produced by computer vision algorithms that perform object detection, semantic segmentation or three-dimensional layout estimation. The intermediate representations produced by such algorithms are then used as a basis for action. This approach to building intelligent systems has thrived in the fertile plains and the soaring towers of academia. Yet it is threatened by a powerful newcomer. A vigorous species is invading from the distant lands of Neurips. This species couples perception and control directly with no intermediate representations. Pixels go in, actions come out. The new species poses a threat to older inhabitants of the fertile plains. If actions can be produced directly, what is the role of computer vision? Are intermediate representations needed at all? We study this question by training agents in simulated environments. Some agents use computer vision to build intermediate representations. Others do not. In urban driving, our agents need to move through busy city streets to reach their goal. On off-road trails, the agents ride on rough mountain roads where a wrong turn can mean an untimely end by plunging off a cliff. In battle, the agents face alien monsters in a fight for life or death. We find that agents that use computer vision are hardier they drive better, survive longer on mountain trails, and emerge victorious in battle. Even when their vision is imperfect, agents that use intermediate representations are stronger. Here we can see agents that use computer vision to drive through city streets. There's other ways to incorporate information such as semantic segmentation into the end-to-end -end learning approach. One way is to use latent space distillation, where in this case here, a teacher network with privileged information, so with access to ground truth semantic segmentation and ground truth affordances is trained for the control task. And then a student network that has access only to the RGB image is also trained for the control task, but at the same time tries to minimize its latent embedding, the distance of its latent embedding with respect to the segmentation embedding of the teacher network. And there's more evidence, more related findings that demonstrate that 
intermediate computer vision representations are actually useful for generalization. There's works that demonstrate the utility in reinforcement learning environments. There is works that demonstrate the utility in generalizing from synthetic data to real world driving. And there's works that demonstrate the utility in indoor navigation tasks. However, so far there has been no systematic study on label efficiency and the representation granularity that is acquired for the training the intermediate representation. Of course, in practice, this is of high relevance because we cannot assume that this labeled data is available just as it is available in a simulator or in some data sets that have already been annotated. But in practice, we will probably have to create a new data set and acquire labels for this data set. So the critical question here to ask is, what intermediate representation should we choose such that we have minimal effort, minimal manual annotation effort. And this is precisely the question we ask in our research on label efficient visual abstractions. Now, what is a good visual abstraction? Well, first of all, it should be invariant. It should hide irrelevant variations from the control policy. Look, let's look at this example here on the right side, where we have these two bedroom scenes that look quite similar in terms of their content, but the appearance is dramatically different. So if you look at the pixel space, so one is a training example, one is a test example, these distributions are very far from each other. Now the goal of such an intermediate representation is to map this pixel space into some representation space such that these points in that representation space move closer together. In this case, we have used a semantic segmentation of these two images, which looks closer to each other compared to the original images that are further in pixel space. A second desired property is universality, that the uh, model is applicable to a wide range of scenarios, that the Intermediate representation is not restricted as in the case of conditional affordance learning to very specific towns or cities or environments, but that it can actually deal with uh, environments it has not seen before. We also want the representation to be data efficient in terms of memory and computation. And importantly, we want it to be label efficient. We want it to require little manual annotation effort to obtain. In this work, we consider semantics as the intermediate representation, as this has shown to be one of the strongest intermediate representations in prior works, and as it encodes task relevant knowledge, for instance, the road is drivable, as well as priors or um, explicit biases about the world, for instance, in the terms of grouping of similar pixels. Furthermore, 2D representations can be processed with standard 2D convolutional networks for the policy. So they are quite easy to deploy in this end-to-end -end imitation learning framework. A disadvantage, however, for, of semantic segmentation that it is that it's very time intensive for obtaining the actual labels. If we consider one cityscapes image, the authors of cityscapes um, remark that it took about 90 minutes for the annotator to annotate one cityscape's image in terms of its semantic labels, just because it's very difficult to annotate these images at a very high level of detail. But is this detail real, really required? Also, are all the classes really relevant? This is what we ask in this research here. So the research questions that we ask is, what is the trade-off between annotation time and driving performance? Can selecting specific semantic classes even ease policy learning because the policy network is not distracted by irrelevant information? Are visual abstractions trained with few images competitive to visual abstractions trained with large, with large number of images? And how many images are actually needed? Furthermore, is fine-grained annotation important or can we 
use also more coarse-grained annotations, which are cheaper to acquire. And finally, are visual abstractions able to reduce the training variance that we've seen before? Here is the model that we consider. We have a segmentation and detection part here on the left, where the input is an image X, which is transformed through a visual abstraction network into a visual abstraction representation, which we call S. And then we have a standard conditional imitation learner on this visual abstraction that takes this visual abstraction S as input. And in addition, the navigation control command N and the velocity at the current point in time, because we consider only uh, the current image and not uh, previous images, so the model doesn't know anything about the current speed if we don't add it to the system, and produces the control output or the action C. Now composing, composing both these mappings together yields the final policy, which takes an input image X as input, produces a visual abstraction, and then produces finally the action. We use two data sets for training this model. We have NS images annotated with semantic labels. So we have pairs of X and S's. And we have NC images annotated with expert driving controls. So these are pairs of X and C's. And what's important to note here is that we assume that the number of annotated images with semantic labels is much smaller than the number of images um, annotated with expert driving controls. As the number of images annotated with expert driving controls, a larger number of images annotated with expert driving controls is easy to obtain by simply recording driving sequences and also recording the steering wheel and the gas pedal. We train this model in the following way. We first train the visual abstraction network using the semantic data set S. We then apply this network to obtain the control data set. So we apply this visual abstraction network to all the input images of the control data set and obtain this data set C that way and then train the control policy using this control data set. The model we use is the CILRS model from Codevilla et al from ICCV 2019, which is illustrated again here on the right-hand side. The input to this model in our case is not an image, but a visual abstraction, which is embedded into a latent code from which the velocity is predicted and which is then also concatenated with the current velocity for a second network that takes the navigational command as input and finally predicts the control. The output is the control and the velocity at the current point in time. And the loss we use for training this model is the same as in the original CILRS paper, just minimizing the L1 loss of the action and the L1 loss of the velocity. We consider multiple different visual abstractions in our analysis. From the Carlos simulator, we derived 14 relevant classes, which comprise all classes in order to label all the pixels in the image. What you can see here is the privileged segmentation, which is um, what we give as input to the model if we assume that the model has access to the ground truth. This serves as an upper bound for our analysis. In this case, you can see the ground truth semantic segmentation map for all 14 class labels. We also experiment with a reduced number of labels. So we removed some of the labels that we deem not relevant for the driving task so that we only obtain six relevant classes, in particular two stuff classes, road and lane marking, as well as four object classes like car and pedestrian and red and green traffic light. Again, this is privil the privileged segmentation. This is the ground truth segmentation for an upper bound analysis. Next, 
we consider the inferred segmentation. We use the Grand Schuf 14 class model, a 14 class segmentation to train a semantic segmentation model, in our case a ResNet with a feature pyramid network, with a segmentation head, in order to predict a semantic segmentation for the images in the Kala simulation for all the 14 classes. You can see a typical example of such a prediction here. Then we consider the same network for inferring only six classes. So the network cap can spend more capacity on these six classes that we deem more relevant for the driving task. But again, you can see that the output, of course, has some noise compared to the ground truth. And finally, we consider a hybrid visual representation for which training data is even easier to acquire. This hybrid representation considers only two stuff semantic classes, road and lane marking, and in addition considers the four object classes only in terms of their bounding boxes, which can be retrieved using 2D detectors. So we obtain 2D detections for vehicles, pedestrians, and red and green traffic lights. Annotating these bounding boxes is of course easier than annotating the precise boundary of the objects. So it gives, it, it decreases the annotation effort. And what we're interested in is, well, does it still lead to plausible um, policy outcomes? So let's look at our experiments. We evaluate our approach on the Kala 084 no crash benchmark. There are two towns. There's a training town and a test town. At testing, there is a random start and a random target destination selected at the test town. And the goal is to successfully navigate from the start to the target location. And the metric that we use is the Kala metric, which measures the percentage of successfully completed episodes. In other words, the success rate. So we run the agent many times from many different start locations to many different end locations and see how often it can complete the sequence. In this no crash benchmark, there's multiple levels of difficulties integrated. The easiest one is the empty scenario where there's no dynamic agents. Then there's a regular scenario with about 65 agents in the entire town and the dense setting which is the most challenging one with 220 agents that move dynamically in addition to the agent that is trained. The weather situation also changes between the training and the test conditions. You can see the four training conditions that are observed during training here at the top and the remaining 10 uh, test conditions here at the bottom. So these are observed in town two and the training weathers are observed in town one. As you can see, some of these weather conditions are actually quite challenging, such as uh, rain and sunset simultaneously. The first experiment we did is we wanted to identify what are the most relevant classes for the privileged agent. We started with all 14 classes, which include road, lane marking, vehicle, pedestrian, green light, red light, sidewalk, building, fence, pole, vegetation, wall, traffic sign, and other. And then reduced to seven classes by removing building, fence, pole, vegetation, wall, traffic sign, and other from this set of classes. We further reduced to six classes by removing the sidewalk class and furthermore reduced to five classes by removing the lane marking class. What we see here is in green the relative ratio of success for the different number of classes in the empty, regular and dense scenarios and the overall performance here on the right. What you can see is of course the empty scenario is easier than the regular and the dense scenario so performance degrades but the tendency is similar in all of these plots. So let's look at the overall plot here on the right. The tendency is that if we reduce from 14 to six classes, we don't see a drop in performance 
we actually see sometimes even an increase in performance. However, when we reduce to five classes, then we see a drastic performance drop as the lane markings are removed. This means the sidewalk is not as important, but lane markings are for sure important for the model. This might not be surprising, but this experiment provides systematic evidence that this is actually the case. Here's a example in form of a short video. What you can see now on the next uh, seconds on the left are the privileged agent with all um, classes, then the privileged agent using only six classes and the privileged agent using only five classes. What you can see here is that the success rate of the privileged agent with 14 or 6 classes is high. However, with 5 classes, the agent often timeouts or collides. We also did the same experiment using the non privileged client, using the inferred segmentations. We can see a similar behavior. We see that. Um, well, the performance is slightly lower than with the privileged information. However, the performance is, is actually quite on par and in some situations can even be a little bit higher than with the privileged information, which is already an indicator for the fact that the quality of the segmentation might not necessarily need to be as good as for other tasks for this driving task because the control policy can compensate for some of the inaccuracies in the output of the semantic segmentation. But we see a similar behavior as in the previous experiment where the six class representation consistently outperforms uh, the 14 class representation. This is interesting because it means by labeling less classes, we can achieve higher performance on the task that we actually care about, the self-driving task. We therefore use the six class representation for all following experiments. Next, we investigated the impact of the number of annotated images for the learned uh, visual abstractions. We, can, we tested uh, 400 labeled images, 1,600 labeled images, and 6,400 labeled images. Here you can see again the plots for the empty, the regular, the dense, and the overall performance. Let's focus on the overall performance. We see that the performance slightly drops the success rate slightly drops when going from 1,600 to 400 images. However, in all of these cases, the performance is actually quite similar. In particular, there is not much difference between 1,600 and 6,400 images, indicating that actually not that many images are required to be annotated for successfully completing this task. In contrast, prior work exploiting semantics on Kala uses millions of annotated images, which on Kala is of course easily possible, but in the real, real world, annotation time matters. We also analyzed um, the, um, the impact of our even cheaper hybrid representation. The performance of the hybrid representation roughly matches that of the standard semantic segmentation, as we can see in the overall performance plot here. However, the annotation time of the standard segmentation is roughly 300 seconds per image and per class, while in the hybrid case, because we just have these two debounding boxes, we require roughly only 20 seconds per image and class for annotating. So we have a another tenfold increase in annotation time using this hybrid representation that comes as with very little uh, degradation in terms of driving performance. Here are some qualitative results. On the left, we can see the standard representation and on the right, we can see the hybrid representation, both trained with 1,600 images. We can see that they are both successful in many scenarios.
The next thing we investigated is the training variance problem. The training variance problem is evidenced here. If we use the standard CLRS imitation learner that operates on raw images as input, we can see that depending on the training seed, the variance or of the success rate in the test town is very high. So for instance, for seed one, we have 26% here and 48% here. Or in this case, we have 0% success rate for the dense setting and 18% success rate for this uh, seed five. On contrary, the, we found that the training variance is significantly reduced when using a segmentation based intermediate representations of visual abstractions. Here we look at the hybrid representation, the most efficient visual abstraction that we consider in our experiments. We can look, for instance, at the co coefficient of variation, which is basically denoting the standard deviation um, divided by the mean. You can see that this coefficient of variation is significantly lower, almost by a factor of four in all of these settings compared to the image-based imitation learning baseline. This indicates that these intermediate representations can actually be quite beneficial in alleviating this problem of training variants. Finally, we also compare to several state-of-the-art models on the imitation learning task. What we see is that our hybrid model is actually comparable is uh, with these uh, state-of-the-art models. Here we can see the latent uh, distillation approach, VVC CLRS, and the conditional affordance learning approach, which is um, not reaching the performance level of CLRS or our technique. Here's a qualitative comparison to CLRS. Let me briefly summarize now. We have shown that exploiting visual abstractions leads to more robust driving models. And higher segmentation accuracy does not necessarily imply better driving. It's also interesting to note that only few of the commonly used semantic segmentation classes are actually relevant for solving the driving task and lane marking is critical for good performance. We also saw that only few annotations, only 400 or 1,600 annotated images are enough to solve the driving task almost as good as with much more annotated images on the Carla simulator. And we've also seen that hybrid representations have the potential to even further reduce annotation costs without losing um, driving performance. We've even seen that box-based representation can improve the performance on certain dynamic classes. And that the training variance, while high in behavior cloning, should always be reported. And that visual abstractions can significantly lower the training variance. This slide maybe summarizes our approach best. On the left, we can see the um, semantic segmentation obtained from 6,400 finely annotated images with all 14 classes, leading to a success rate of 50% at an annotation time of 7,500 hours. But on the right, we have our efficient hybrid representation that's trained with 1,600 coarsely annotated images on six classes in only 50 hours with a policy success rate of 58%. Now this concludes this part. In the last few minutes, I wanna quickly give you an outlook on a next generation Kitty data set that we had in preparation for a long time, but now finally this summer we'll release it. It's called Kitty 360 because it provides 360 degree imagery and it comes with novel exciting forms of annotation. 
This is what some of the trajectories that we've recorded look like. And I think it's a particularly interesting data set also for the multimodal community because it comes with all kinds of information that can be considered jointly. For instance, it comes with the classic front-facing stereo camera, but also with a 360-degree fisheye camera that allows for a full 360-degree surround view. It has the classic Velodyne HDL64 laser scanner, but also a SIG Pushbroom laser scanner for better coverage of buildings and trees. And it comes with an IMU GPS localization system as the original the Kitty dataset. There are about uh, 83,000 frames of four cameras and the laser scans, covering a driving distance of roughly 73 kilometers. All frames are accurately geolocalized such that additional information, site information, for instance, from OpenStreetMap can be utilized. And we have annotated the data set using semantic labels, both in 3D and 2D. And the semantic label definitions are consistent with the Cityscapes data set, such that cross data set generalization performance can be analyzed. <clears throat> Furthermore, each instance is assigned with a consistent instance ID across all frames. So we don't only have individual IDs for individual frames, but we have it all consistent in 3D over the entire sequence. Here are some illustrations of what the data set looks like. Here we have a point cloud, colored point cloud using the RGB cameras. We have the bounding boxes. The data set is annotated using 3D bounding boxes, but in contrast to the original KIDA data set, we have also now bounding boxes for the road and the sidewalk and the trees and the buildings, etc. These bounding boxes are used to infer per pixel um, labels for each point in the point cloud and also per point instance labels. And we have developed an algorithm that can then map this information into the 2D image domain to yield approximately accurate 2D ground truth, both for semantic segmentation and for instance segmentation. We also output a confidence so that we know in which regions of the image we are confident about the estimates of the ground truth and in which regions we are not. Finally, we've produced a little cinematic video trailer, which I'd like to show you here now at the end.
we will release this data set this summer and we'll hope that this data set fosters new exciting research areas. With that, I want to thank you for your attention and I want to also thank my sponsors and point you to our blog page if you're interested in our research. I invite you to have a look at this link here. Thank you very much.